gathered here today in Ottawa, part of the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin Anishinaabe people. Canada 2020, as always, is extremely grateful to be part of this land's continued history of sharing and an exchange of ideas. For those who don't know me, I'm Brent Cayley, Executive Director of Canada 2020, and for over 15 years now, Canada 2020 has been committed to building a progressive future for Canada and helping shape a more progressive world. For events, research, podcasts, and more, we've built a network of progressive ideas and people that shape policy conversations and action, and that's why we're here today. And today is a special day for us as we're launching our first research report, full research report, in some time. And we're thrilled to be sharing the results of this incredible project with you. After a year-long process of convening research and incredible conversations, which many of you were a part of, uh, to lead to this big one today. It's a time of enormous overlapping transitions facing the people of this country and the, the economy we share between rural, smaller, indigenous, remote, and then of course, urban and suburban communities. We're grateful to all of you for being a part of where we take that next. And first and foremost, I'd like to thank Matthew Mendelson, Canada 2020 Senior Fellow and the author of the report. He's right over here if he can give us a wave. Uh, he's undoubtedly among the keenest policy minds that Canada has known, with a reputation for honing in on the kinds of details and processes that actually get things done. You'll hear more from him shortly. And I also want to acknowledge our friends at Shorefast, uh, who are doing really important work on supporting community economies and have been vital guides in shaping today's discussions too. And with extraordinary importance to this whole endeavor, I'd like to offer special thanks to TELUS for supporting this project from the beginning and the many aspects that have been a part of it over the course of more than a year now. It's been clear in talking with Jacob and the team at TELUS that you have a truly unique appreciation of the kinds of really unimaginable opportunities that are there now and can be unlocked for Canadians if we invest in the future of rural, indigenous, remote, and small town communities across Canada. And to that end, I'd love to bring up Jacob Glick, the Vice President of Public Policy at TELUS, to share a few thoughts. Please give him a warm welcome. Thanks very much. Thanks very much. Uh, thanks, everybody. Um, I'm uh, really grateful to Canada 2020 and to Matthew in particular for leading this important piece of scholarship. Uh, it's an important piece of scholarship because the rural urban divide is a pressing issue in Canada and a pressing issue of inequality. And it's inequality across a variety of indicia and outcomes health outcomes, educational outcomes, economic outcomes. And so I'm really particularly happy that Matthew's paper and the work that he's done with uh, stakeholders throughout the process have targeted not just one aspect, but a variety of those aspects in thinking about how policy can help alleviate that inequality and also address some of the schisms, social and otherwise, that we see in our society as a function of that urban-rural divide. At TELUS, we know that broadband can be a critical driver of bridging that urban-rural divide and delivering the kinds of outcomes in health, education, economic opportunity, and otherwise, that we know that Canadians in rural, indigenous uh, Canada both uh, deserve and uh, require. And we also know that in addition to bridging that divide, that we will only achieve our climate targets if we invest in those communities, invest in the necessary digital infrastructure. Because in fact, digital policy is the same as climate policy. And so when we're thinking about some of the urban rural challenges that are going to be discussed today, on the panel and are discussed in detail in the report, we should think about how do we deliver collectively as a society on the social outcomes in health, education, economic opportunity, but also how do we leverage those on delivering on the climate outcomes we need. And so as uh, TELUS, we are committed to doing our part. We're investing billions of dollars in rural communities. We're connecting thousands of communities and indigenous lands across Canada. And we're doing much of that on our own accord and much of that in partnership with the government of Canada through the Universal Broadband Fund. 
We're very pleased to be what I would call the Universal Broadband Fund's platinum partner, uh, <laughs> because all of our projects are delivered on time, on budget. And that's a point of pride for us because we know the faster we connect those communities, the faster that they can achieve the potential that connectivity gives them in terms of new outcomes and climate um, and climate opportunities as well. So thank you very much, Canada 2020. Thank you, Minister, for joining us. And uh, thank you, Matthew, as well. And I look forward to today's conversation. Thank you so much, Jacob. And once again, a huge thanks to TELUS for supporting this work. As I mentioned, TELUS's commitment to connection and innovation is essential to the future of these small and rural communities that we'll be talking so much today. On behalf of our whole team, including Anna Ganey, who is our executive chair and right there, I'd also like to thank our sustaining partners who along with TELUS and Ms. who's been one of them has enabled projects like this and so much more over the course of the past year and more. So many of us know someone who decided to pick up and move from an urban center to a smaller or more rural community during the pandemic and the extraordinary times that many of those periods through it were. Through those small and rural communities face unique challenges across this country, we know one thing for sure, and that's that inclusive and sustainable growth principles need to be foundational to economic decision making in every part of this country and for communities of all sizes. We need systems that create opportunities for all, regardless of the size of each community each one of us chooses to call home. To speak about that and to introduce the report to us all, I'm thrilled to introduce a special guest who has a unique understanding of both these opportunities and challenges. Please welcome our Minister of Rural Economic Development, my good friend, the Honorable Goody Hutchings. Thanks so much for being here. Thanks, Braden. It's wonderful to be here with you. And yeah, I've got a little passion for rural. Um, look, first of all, thanks to each and every one of you for being here today. Anna, always a privilege and a privilege and, and just a pleasure to see you. Matthew, thanks for your work. Uh, Braden again. Jacob, with uh, your golden, yeah, you're in the top. You're in the top. I've, I'm, I'm dealing with all the ISPs, but yes, you are one of the top. Always good to see you, my friend, Zita, from Shorefast. In case you didn't know, we both share love for Newfoundland and Labrador. Chief Kelly, looking forward to a new friendship we've just started. Mike, wonderful to chat with you. you what you're doing is truly amazing. And Jonathan, incredible stuff that we're all going to do together, I know. I also want to acknowledge we're here today on the unceded territory, the Algonquin and Anishabi people. So look, thanks to Canada 2020 for bringing us all together. And thank you for your focus on rural. And congrats on the report. Because it's so amazing to see such diverse and engaged group here to talk about with us today about the report, but about rural policy and economic development. Our government knows, and trust me, I know, what you all know, that rural Canada is a land of opportunity and the building of the economy of tomorrow does start in rural Canada. However, there are challenges, but with those challenges are opportunities. And we've got to take advantage of those opportunities. But to do that, it takes us to really get in and tackle a job and address those challenges. Look, we know there's housing, lack of housing, and it's not just social housing, it's housing for economic development. The gaps in community infrastructure, because if you have the housing project coming, do you have the water and wastewater to, to, to serve those houses? Transit and access, healthcare, childcare, and the change in climate, you're so right, it is impacting all of us. And trust me, I know, for those of you who watched the news, Hurricane Fiona hit in my backyard. And that was a real eye-opener for individuals as well, because it was, yeah, that happens somewhere else. That never happens here. And when people were saying, oh, it's going to be bad, high winds, and people were like, we've lived here all our life. My, I'm in my grandmother's house. This house has been here forever. Well, sadly, there's about 100 homes that aren't there now because we had 100 foot waves come in. So climate change is real. The other part, sad part that we've got to, to address, and I'm hoping that comes up in our discussion today, and I know you talk about it too, Matthew, is the exodus of long, young people to cities and barriers, because they don't know what we know, that one of the best places to live is in rural Canada. And again, I can't agree with, I have to agree with everybody, the access to affordable, reliable internet is key I call it the equalizer for rural Canada and urban Canada. 
Um, and we're doing a great job on that. I'll give you more details in my remarks on that, but we are getting that done because that is the equalizer for rural and remote communities. The other part that we hear often is that towns and villages and hamlets, they've only got one or two paid employees. So the capacity to deal with the onerous task of government employees or day-to-day -day work and the, you know, fix the light bulb in the fire department. Do I shovel the driveway? Do I get out the local tax bills? Oh, we've got an order apart for the, the pump. Or do I sit down and fill out an onerous government application that our mayor may not be successful in getting? So my job, and that of everybody in this room, is to support all of the above, and especially the small towns and communities in the critical work. Because if we don't have buy-in from community, we don't have buy-in from anyone. We're not going to get it done. And I'm not a top-down person. I am work with communities on the ground to get things done. Because we've got to realize, we all know it, but the benefits of growing these incredible opportunities in rural Canada aren't for rural Canadians. They're for the whole country. We know 30% of the GDP comes from Canada, from rural Canada. How do we grow that? We know that 20% of our population is there. How do we grow that? Because the solutions for many of our pressing problems in Canada do come from rural. We talk about critical minerals now to fuel the electric vehicles or tomorrow. Those mines aren't in downtown Toronto. We talk about food security for us and frankly the rest of the world. Fish and grain and other staples, they're found in rural and coastal communities and indigenous communities. They're not found in downtown Ottawa, maybe a little bit. And economic drivers from other natural resources and, of course, tourism opportunities, they're overwhelmingly in rural Canada and including those incredible products developed in partnerships with our indigenous communities. So I want to tell you today to let you know that, yes, our government recognizes these opportunities. I see these opportunities. And it's going beyond a rural lens. It's actual rural considerations have to be at the forefront to ensure we take advantage. And the one thing that we are at the forefront of is our first national broadband strategy, and it's the largest investment ever and we are on track to connect 98% of Canadians to high-speed, affordable, reliable internet by 2026 and every other Canadian by 2030. And that's ahead of schedule, I might add. We've had the creation of the Centre for Rural Economic Development, which now includes 22 federal folks all across rural communities across the country. So they're working with communities, with um, not-for-profits, with Indigenous communities, with small business, to help people in accessing funding letting them understand what is out there and ensuring that they can feed policy decisions and information and back into program development. That's key because not everything is developed here in Ottawa, contrary to what some people might think. We need to know that we have dedicated programs and streams to build up our rural communities. We have a rural transit fund, a rural and northern infrastructure stream. We've got rural immigration. We have small craft harbors, so important to our coastal communities. We've got the disaster mitigation and adaptation fund. I could go on. But we all know that we have to support the people who call rural Canada home. And we were there during COVID, um, where we saw rural-based industries particularly hard hit. But now we need to look forward. And I'm telling you, we will. I'm looking forward to the discussion today. I find it really innovative to be here with all these incredible friends and uh, looking forward to the conversation. Thanks so much. Reach out anytime. All right. Thank you very much, Minister, for those remarks and setting the table for a lot of what I know the panel will get into very shortly. We're so delighted that you could be here today and very proud of a lot of the work that you're doing on these files already and how passionately you speak about all of the country. I then want to turn next to the author and lead on the report himself, who I introduced a little bit earlier, but over to you, Matthew, to uh, describe a little bit about what we're getting into today. Thank you. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm so happy to be here in person. Uh, hello to everyone who's not quite here in person yet. Uh, this has been uh, a project that we've been working on collectively for uh, about a year, uh, and it's just a real privilege. I'm very grateful to Canada 2020, to TELUS, uh, to the Minister for being here, for the variety of partnerships uh, that uh, we've undertaken over the last year, and also many people in this room uh, and uh, following along with Zoom who uh, 
uh, I interviewed, who I spoke to, who came to co consultations, who came to meals, um, and helped me understand uh, many of the issues because this panel is going to be deep and rich with people who uh, have deep experience uh, and lived reality in rural and small town uh, Canada from a variety of different communities and perspectives. But I certainly do not present myself as an expert uh, in rural Canada. That isn't my background. But uh, I have spent a long time now, um, almost 30 years working in public policy in a variety of different areas, including uh, in, uh, in areas of economic development. And um, I'm just really grateful to try and pull all of these things together to consolidate uh, the wisdom that I've heard from many of the people uh, here. Uh, and to do that in a way that acknowledges um, uh, the realities that many of the discussions we're having uh, about rural land are on uh, treated land or on unceded territory um, uh, have to be undertaken consistent with UNDRIP and treaty rights and inherent rights. Um, and so we're really conscious of that in uh, this project. But I also just want to highlight before we get into uh, the panel that uh, we're also talking about uh, two projects. So I'm very excited uh, that Canada 2020 has, uh, has launched this project uh, and paper. Um, and people here will also know that uh, uh, Shorefast Foundation released a paper about a month ago that also speaks to community economic development uh, that I was involved with. And I kind of cribbed a little bit from both papers. So it's, uh, it's, you know, it's always good to be able to save some work. But we're going to try and talk about both of those uh, in, the, in the panel that's coming up. Before we do, though, uh, I just wanted to um, uh, make maybe five uh, points uh, before we get into uh, the discussion. The first is kind of over 30 years um, of my professional life as I look back, the question of uh, inevitable urbanization has always been present in public policy discussions, and that has always been uh, uh, an assumption of many of the economic and social policy discussions that I've been a part of over 30 years. Um, and I think the last three years have revealed um, new uh, opportunities across the country. Um, and uh, we're going to get into this with Mike and Zita and the minister. Uh, but uh, I really think we are at a moment where uh, we collectively can commit ourselves to uh, renewing the social contract uh, in Canada in a way that is inclusive uh, and that is done in a way that ensures the quality of opportunity and good quality of life for every Canadian, regardless of where they live in what region uh, or the size of their community. Um, both the projects, the Shorefast one and the Canada 2021 speak about community as an entity or place-based as an approach. And the second comment I want to make is just how hard this is to do. Um, that isn't how we're organized in government. Um, the minister uh, deals with this every day, uh, and these are all cliches, but governments, federal, provincial, are organized around problems or issues and ministries, and they're vertically organized. It's really tough to think of the community as the dependent variable, like how we strengthen the community as, uh, as a whole. It's really tough to align all kinds of different efforts to invest in place and the assets of a place and the value of the place. Um, it's hard, but what is exciting is, you know, the first step is understanding where you're trying to go and achieving that. And so I'm just really happy that I think collectively we are recognizing that we need to think about community and think about place uh, when we are making decisions. They're not just places where policies and programs happen. They are living ecosystems uh, that have meaning to the people there and have existing relationships. Um, the third comment I just want to make is the real opportunity that we uh, have in front of us and the obligation to seize it. Um, Canada is growing. Um, we have ambitious immigration targets. We not only have uh, an obligation to ourselves to grow, but we have an obligation to the world to grow. It is in our economic interests, it is in our social interests, it is in our ge geopolitical necessity to be a bigger country. Um, and how do we grow sustainably? Um, and we have seen over the last three years um, with work from home, with increased access to digital, with distributed workforce, uh, with policies that allow people um, to, to be 
more mobile with housing crises and infrastructure crises. People are making choices about where they want to live and businesses are making choices about where they want to invest. And we have to make sure that the public sector, private sector, co-ops, not-for-profits um, uh, make all of those choices possible. Um, the fourth comment I want to make is about how uh, important this is. Uh, when we look around globally, uh, we see uh, regional resentments, uh, hardening of identities uh, when people feel they don't have a stake in the system, uh, easy mobilization of territorially based resentments and polarization. Uh, uh, we see what that does to democratic legitimacy and the sense of shared citizenship and civil society. And so from my perspective, it is so important that everyone, regardless of where they live, um, feels that their identities, their values are respected and recognized, are invested in, are valued, um, and that those identities um, are, are um, uh, protected and worthwhile and that leaders uh, recognize their importance. Um, the final comment I want to make is just how uh, this uh, agenda for uh, rural economic and community development for smaller places in Canada uh, aligns so well with some of the things that I think we all recognize need to take place. Uh, we have a growth imperative. Um, we are going to grow um, and we will continue to grow. And how do we do that in a sustainable, inclusive way that protects our, uh, our democratic institutions and our values and allows people to prosper? We have a supply side imperative. How do we build and grow in ways that are sustainable? We know there are real supply side, sorry, supply chain challenges, labor challenges, approval processes um, uh, are sometimes challenging. How do we deal with growth uh, and supply in ways that allow all com uh, communities to prosper. So with that, I'm going to kind of wrap up by just saying in the paper, there is what I would call a coherent framework and an agenda. I'm not going to go into all of those pieces, but core to those pieces are injecting capital into communities of all sizes in much more aggressive ways, um, recognizing the value of community um, and the value of place as having meaning uh, and as important assets in themselves. Uh, investing in people's capacity for planning um, to develop investable assets and projects uh, that uh, are meaningful to people in the communities but are attractive to people outside of the communities. And deep support for the architectures of collaboration. One of the themes throughout the Canada 2020 paper but also the Shorefast paper um, is how important it is to support architectures of collaboration and people coming together at the local level to solve real problems. And with that, comes an obligation to devolve power and decision making, devolve resources, seed power, seed control to local decision makers who understand and recognize what communities need and where uh, um, uh, and which assets are valuable and uh, where investments can be made to support sustainable and inclusive growth for the people who live there and attract uh, other people. So I'd encourage people to read read the paper um, and look through the kind of detailed program and policy agenda around capital and community and collaboration and building out social, economic and digital infrastructure and accelerating uh, those processes. And hopefully a lot of those things are going to come up in our discussion today. So with that, I'm super excited to introduce our panelists. Uh, um, you can give them big rounds of applause as they come up. Uh, or not. Zita Cobb, founder and CEO of Shorefast, Minister Goody, Goody Hutchings, uh, Minister of Rural Economic Development, Chief Kelly LaRocca of the Mississaugas of the Skewcog Island First Nation, Councillor Jonathan Scott from Bradford West Gillenberry, and uh, Mike Moffat, Senior Director at Smart Prosperity. It says that, but uh, I would also point out that he is the founding director of a new think tank called PLACE. And do we have enough chairs or am I standing?
for being here. Um, uh, and uh, I did also want to just uh, say hi to my colleagues. I know there are many of my uh, co former colleagues here, so just uh, hi. I saw Catherine Lewitt here, uh, the Deputy for Economic Development, and we're grateful for the public servants who are you know, participating in this. Um, uh, as my uh, computer kind of recharges, uh, I'm going to start um, uh, by asking Zita and Mike. Both of you are involved with, Mike, a very new project, Zita, Shorefast in the Community Economies pilot, kind of, you know, on paleontological time. It's a relatively uh, new project. Can you tell us a bit about, uh, Mike, I'll go to you first, why you have started this, what it is. I remember talking to you about uh, strategies for mid-sized and small Ontario cities 10 years ago. It seemed eccentric and no one was particularly interested, but now we have a variety of different initiatives. Um, and also, if you can, what are the data telling us about the importance of this over the last uh, three years? Well, well, thank you for that, that question. Yeah, absolutely. A decade ago, this was eccentric and nobody cared, and now it's eccentric, but people care. So, you know, I'll take that uh, take that as a benefit. So, yeah, so I uh, run a think tank here in Ottawa called the uh, Smart Prosperity Institute, and our goal at SPI is to grow the economy within nature's limits. So basically, how can we achieve all the economic success that we want? How can we uh, get a, a middle class that prospers while at the same time hitting our net zero goals. And we found a lot of time when we were on the road, we would do a lot of innovation projects, some agricultural projects, and we kept kind of hearing the same thing over and over, that we would hear that, that yeah, we see this as a necessity, and yeah, we think on net that this is good for Canada, but we don't really think it's good for our community, right? That we see how Canada can prosper from this, but we don't, you know, we don't see how this is necessarily uh, good for, um, we, we heard this in Charlottetown, for instance. And it was one of these things that just kept coming up again and again and again. And we said, okay, you know, there, we think there, there's something here that we need to continue the, the work that we're doing on SP, at SPI around you know, carbon pricing, clean innovation. But we also have to understand that a net zero economy in Windsor, Ontario is just going to inherently look different than one in Windsor, Nova Scotia. So at SPI, what we are at the, the new place center, which we founded, which uh, is about a couple weeks old uh, now, we work with uh, policymakers on the ground and, and community stakeholders on the ground to sort of co-create solutions and co-create basically a vision of what a uh, what a thriving economy, uh, thriving net zero economy would look like in 2050 for these communities. So we're doing some work with, uh, you know, I'm from the London area, so obviously we're doing some work with the London Economic Development Corporation to try and, to try and answer these questions. How can we work with the universities and colleges and, and politicians to all come together and have sort of a shared vision to recognize, again, that we're not just trying to create uh, a, a bunch of Silicon Valley wannabes, because that's just not going to work. It's about taking the existing strengths of the community and saying, okay, how can we leverage those assets uh, to, to get us to, to uh, someplace that works in, in 2050? Um, and to the sort of final question about you know, how things have changed, 10 years ago, when you and I were working together, the big issues that we had in southwestern Ontario was like the loss of about half a million manufacturing jobs. And we were trying to figure out how do we keep places like, like Ingersoll, Ontario, you know, these, these big sort of manufacturing centers, how do we keep them as going concerns? Over the last four or five years, it, they've had basically all of the sort of opposite problems of, they've had now problems of growth, right? They've become suburbs of the GTA, largely because of the housing crisis. So now these communities are having to face these dual challenges where they still have those challenges of blue collar labor displacements and some of the things that go around with that, like um, you know issues around uh, fentanyl and drug abuse and, and homelessness, while at the same time, you know they're, they're gentrifying. It's to the point now that a, a, a house in Tilsonburg costs more than a Tokyo condo. And it certainly costs more than a, uh, a than a home in Calgary. So we're in this weird, unique situation where we're still trying to deal with the challenges from deindustrialization, 
while at the same time trying to figure out how uh, to navigate a new world of, of population growth and, and uh, high real estate values. Uh, thank you, Mike. Uh, to some extent, with some of your work, where um, uh, Mike's work has been focused on place-based and uh, community-based co-creation uh, for sustainable communities. You've been living that kind of uh, in a real way day-to-day -day with uh, projects across the country. So can you tell us a bit about uh, that and why you think that's so important considering your background in finance and uh, business and now you're leading social enterprises across the country uh, with the community focus. I think we have to go back to the beginning. And so Always. We, all the way back to the beginning. I was born in 1958. Milton Friedman's article about the purpose of a company is to make money for its shareholders in 1970. Joey Smallwood's resettlement program for Oakport, Newfoundland was 1965. The inshore fishery that we've been a part of for many generations, hundreds of years, collapsed with the arrival of the industrialization of the fishery. My father looked at me as a 10-year-old and he said, nobody understood, like, why are they fishing day and night until all the fish are gone? He said, they must be turning, this is a man who never had a bank account, who never had a bank, he, he said, they must be turning the fish into money. And without knowing the word, he, he actually named financialization. And he said to me as a 10-year-old, you have to go and study this money stuff because it's going to eat everything we love. So I did. And I fell in love with business. It is one of the, the most important things that we have been invented as humans. And my career was in weight division multiplexing, which are all the little optical bits that enable the digital age. One of the things that's happened in the course of my lifetime uh, not only uh, to credit it to uh, Milton Friedman, is we forgot about place. We became agnostic to it, in some cases hostile to it. And so I think we've now are in a time where we need to reconcile a whole bunch of systems. We have organized our country, and every, we're not the only country that's done this, we organize organized around systems management. And we now realize, oh wait, there is that little matter of place and place matters. So why does place matter? Place matters because actually it contains nature. We happen to be embodied. That's unavoidable. So we live in a place. Everybody lives in a place. Culture is nothing more than a human response to a place. So nature and culture are the two great assets of, of, of life. We call them resources. They're not resources. They're assets. Like when you talk about human resources and we talk about financial assets, wrong language, kind of turn it around. If you think that money is an asset and this human in front of us is a resource, guess what's going to happen? So need no language. And so I know that we're talking about rural. I think what Canada is facing, it, many things we are facing as a country, and uh, one of them is we have a scale, set of scale problems. Whatever we are, 6,000 communities across this country. Something like a third of us live in communities that are 50,000 or less. And in those communities, and Matthew said at the beginning, live assets, people, culture. And I think the big question of human, humans everywhere is how do the parts belong to the whole? How does a part called Esteban belong to a country called Canada? What are the systems that support this? And we have to solve if Canada is going to do all the things that we all dream about doing and, and keep the things that help us make meaning. We have, we have to become masters of working at different scales. And whoever that person was that said fewer, bigger is better, we need to find that person. And if they've passed away, we need to dig them up and kill them again. <laughs> <laughs> because sometimes we need big and sometimes we need medium and sometimes we need small. It, and if we're clever, and I think we're as clever as anybody, we look like we are, Mike Moffat, you're, you're clever as anybody, we got to figure out what are the systems that support different scales, whether that's in banking, whether it's in how we roll out broadband, that thank you to tell us for this, this project. When we were starting the broadband project, you know, along comes uh, the application stuff, and, and, and Minister, you spoke to this, and you know it because I know you live it. Even the mayor at the time of our community said, well, I'm not filling that out. And I said, why not? He said, well, first of all, we don't know what an ISP is. 
And even if you knew what it was, we don't know one. It's like, oh. Right. This is the reality of life outside of the professional world, as probably many of us here working. I don't know if I answered it. So the, to the pilot project and Matthew to the report, the other report that we alluded to is about community economies. I don't believe in the urban rural divide. I think that's, that's just a piece of nonsense we need to let go. There are communities of different sizes. Urban activates a whole bunch of different sized communities around it. Um, so we got together with uh, five Canadian communities, Fogo Island, Prince Edward County, which is a super interesting place for looking at economic development, London, Ontario. Mike, if I'd known you were up there then, we would have like got tangled up <laughs> with each other. Uh, and Hamilton, Ontario and Victoria, BC to look at what are the levers, what are the, the how do you, how do you uh, strengthen community economies of different sizes? Uh, thank you, Zita. Uh, and, and a lot of those levers and a lot of the themes that you've been driving uh, in, um, uh, in those community economy pilots, those are about capital, those are about collaboration and getting local leaders to identify problems and solutions and mobilize resources. Um, and um, I'm uh, really uh, also supportive of the idea of ecosystems of communities. Like uh, when you talk about a large community, an urban community, but that creates ecosystems of activity uh, all around it and how those pieces fit together and how they are mutually beneficial rather than zero sum. I hope we're going to get a chance to talk about those uh, in, a, in a second. But I'd like to ask uh, Chief LaRocca now um, just how this conversation resonates with some of your work because you've been a leader uh, in community economic development. Uh, there is an investment uh, I think uh, approach uh, to to your work uh, and uh, the framework agreement on First Nations land management uh, was an important step and you were a leader in that and it gives, I, I'm curious how control of resources and land um, and assets impacts your ability to, to make investments for the development of your community. Thanks for the question. Sorry, can everyone hear me okay? Uh, my mic fell off. I um, So it's a pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me. I, um, I'm from Scugog Island First Nation, which is about an hour and a half northeast of the city of Toronto. And we are a tiny, but uh, I always say small but mighty community. We entered into the uh, framework agreement for First Nations lands management. Oh gosh, when was that? Back in the late 90s, I guess it was first conceived and um, <clears throat> passed our land code in 2000, I believe. What does that mean? Basically, the framework agreement for First Nations lands management um, is, is an agreement between the federal government and First Nations who are signatory to, to the process. And what it does is it carves out the um, land management provisions of the Federal Indian Act and basically replaces them with this new contract. And that agreement is an incremental approach to self-government. It basically gives First Nations the ability to govern their own land within that uh, reserve boundary or that First Nation boundary. So what it did for, for us at Scugog was it allowed and enabled us to lease our land without waiting on ministerial approval. So it basically, um, I guess this this paper resonates with me because it it uh, it's an architect for collaboration, right? It's an it's an it's architecture for collaboration is really what the uh, framework for First Nations lands management is. Um, it it allowed um, us to step away from that top down approach of the Indian Act and and govern our lands accordingly to the to the ways in which we felt uh, we needed to do as a community, and it enabled gaming, which for our community at the time, um, you know, it was a big, it was a big gamble, not pardon the pun, but it, um, we had to give up a third of our land base and uh, basically engage in a partnership uh, with, the, with a company who was willing to take a risk on us. And we had uh, a hefty loan arrangement, the, the interest payment we had to make, unfortunately, that was well beyond market. But we, we did it um, because really we had no other uh, access to capital to build the place. And um, 
we struggled for the first few years, but uh, really the, it, the business took off because gaming at that time in the province was really, there was a paucity of regulation and not a lot of competition and, yeah. and some nimbyism too. So nobody wanted it in their backyard. And when the First Nations were willing to try it and take it on, we, we took a risk, as I said, but uh, it worked. And what that business has done is it's allowed us to have an anchor really an anchor business to to um, to back fund things like band support funding and health services and uh, education and other infrastructure. So it really um, paid the lion's share of our uh, recent um, water water treatment project, which uh, enabled us to get rid of our drinking water advisory that was longstanding since 2008. So, you know, with some help of the federal and provincial governments, of course, but uh, the lion's share was borne by us, and we we're quite proud of that. Um, so that's that's how I see this as, I guess, relevant to our community, and certainly, um, I'll, I'll leave it at that. I hope I answered your question. <laughs> you, you did, uh, uh, great, and this is something Zita and I have spoken about a lot, which is uh, the role of anchor institutions and how, uh, at least for some people, anchor institutions are know, hospitals or colleges, um, and those are important to community, and they create uh, a variety of different opportunities, but they can also be big not-for-profits, or they can be big uh, private sector firms that uh, are embedded in the community, that are connected to the community. A lot of the OECD uh, framework on rural economic development that is in the paper talks about this paradigm shift away from you know, kind of attracting a business that's not really part of the community to one that is really uh, valued by the community and embedded in the community and feels obligations and a sense of mutual uh, responsibility to the community. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's that's fascinating. Um, uh, Minister, you've been listening uh, to this uh, for a bit, and um, uh, I, I think a lot of this resonates with your agenda and what the government uh, has been pursuing and um, with uh, your strategies and frameworks and also your mandate letter, um, but there's a lot here. Um, how do you go about prioritizing this from infrastructure to broadband to housing to mental health? I mean, how, how, how do you prioritize all of this agenda as, as Minister of Rural Development? Uh, Matthew, thanks, and again, thanks for the invitation. And wonderful to be here with this. Uh, I think we're just going to run out of time today. I think we could be here all afternoon. Um, you said the word vertical earlier, and that's what my job is to break down that vertical. And you obviously read my mandate letter, as many people have. Mine is more horizontal, right? Um, my main goal, and we're getting it thanks to TELUS and, and others, is we are getting the country connected. Because as I've said in my remarks, that is the equalizer for anything, for indigenous communities, for economic growth, for fish plants, for education. That is the equalizer, and we are getting that one done. But it's also to take all this knowledge that we glean. And by the way, since I've been minister, I think I've done 70 odd roundtables from coast to coast to coast on various topics. And each of them, it's been on housing. It's been on economic development. It's been on rural immigration. It's been rural health care, rural tourism, rural youth. I've done seniors. I've done transit. I've done air access. And that helps me build my uh, war chest of information, frankly, so that I am helped better better able to help my colleagues and as i said earlier to break through this vertical bubble here that we all need to you know break down the silos and work collectively to make sure that we are doing better policy so um the other thing that we did in the um in the universal broadband fund which i'm very very proud of and as tell us well well i'm sure jacob will agree with me we came out with what we call the pathfinder service so the universal broadband was announced just before the pandemic hit and even though connectivity was an issue long before the pandemic, I think the pandemic ripped off the Band-Aid and it was like some people were, were others were like, what is this stuff that I need it? So we, we put out a rapid response stream and they were small projects to get out on the ground right away to get communities connected. And in that we had a Pathfinder service. So that was a 1-800 number and an email that somebody could call and say, what is an ISP? How do I get connected? <laughs> Um, what, what do I do next? We are a small town. We're an indigenous community. We've got a business that wants to put in and put in some money. How do we make this happen? And I was so proud of the department because they were back to people within two business days. 
and then hundreds and hundreds and thousands of groups that we helped connect the dots. And that was not my aha moment, because I kind of knew it, of the 220 communities I look after. Uh, my smallest has 42 people. The largest doesn't have 20,000 people. So most of my communities have a couple of hundred people. So I saw on the ground, I call it the rural realities of small communities. How do I deal with this? I know my town wants to be, everybody says we want to be connected. How do I do? So the Pathfinder service was a huge, huge plus. It's been such a plus that we're now suggesting to other government departments, and they're coming back to us to say, okay, that worked for you. Now we're looking at another component of rural. Maybe we should use it. I'm saying you should use it, be it urban, rural, anybody. There's always that, you know, let's help people get it done. So I, I, I take so much advice from the roundtables. I'm going to take so much advice from this group and your report. And again, I use it with all my colleagues of, with all my colleagues to educate them on how rural has to be different. We can't have an application for a thousand unit building in downtown Ottawa, the same as a 10 unit building in Fogawana. So um, we're breaking that through. Our government has done a great job of putting an LGBTQ plus lens on policy and programs and legislation. We put an indigenous lens. And now I'm proud to say we put a rural reality on how is this program really gonna work in rural Canada. So that's, uh, that's fascinating. I think a lot of people don't know uh, about that rural lens and that approach and the Pathfinder uh, approach and the fact that many departments that I'm engaging with, some of whom are here, and you may have played a, a role in this, are moving more staff to local communities so that they are engaged in you know, mutual capacity building, making sure Ottawa understands what's going on in small communities, but um, uh, also uh, helping a small community understand which programs are available and how to navigate them. Um, and that capacity imbalance is so important, right? Like if there's a one public servant versus kind of the capacity of all of the processes that exist in, uh, in this town, um, are, you, uh, are you finding it, uh, what are your, some of your biggest challenges in bridging those uh, capacity uh, gaps or breaking down processes because you're working horizontally which is hard um, how are you finding uh, it to um, uh, to uh, get other departments or ministries to adopt that rural lens so you don't know me very well Matt but in Newfoundland you either go around the challenge over it sometimes you just go straight through it right so look, the prime minister um, when he when he asked me to take this seat around the table I was over the moon because I was like, oh my golly, I understand the opportunities in rural. Um, and you're right, the first thing I did with, with the first meeting that I had with the, with the CENRAD team, the Center of Rural Economic Development and the department at ICID was like, okay, who do we have on the ground, right? This is great that we've got people here in Ottawa, but I need people on the ground all throughout Canada. And I was like, okay. And that's one thing I've learned in this, you do get the yes minister every now and then. So we do have that now. And I'm like, okay, now we need more because we've proven that they're working. So it's, it's more of that. And it's now that we, I actually have ministers coming to me and say, will you look at this? Can your policy people look at this? Because they know when we get around the cabinet table, I'm going to say, did you put the rural, where, where's the rural piece on this? Right. And they're coming to me beforehand, which is great because that's how we be effective when it's beforehand that we know that we're actually making a difference on the ground. And like I said, the input that I've gotten from coast to coast to coast helps me. So I can, you know, I know my province well, but I've been so fortunate to travel the country and the rural realities are the same. But I agree with Zita, we've got to stop talking rural, urban. We've got to start talking about this incredible country of which urban has some great, rural has even better, but. <laughs> Um, uh, that, that will be the steel cage match at some point at a future yes. 2020 uh, b uh, between the minister and, uh, uh, minister, uh, and another one. Um, the, uh, Jonathan, I haven't forgotten you. Uh, the, um, uh, you are uh, a municipal politician, a local councillor. Um, how has, uh, and you and I had a conversation earlier about some of the topics in the paper that you found were uh, relevant to your work procurement policy, those kinds of things. But you've been listening to this for a while. How does, uh, what is your reaction to this conversation in terms of the realities that you face day to day, the realities you face dealing with federal and provincial governments that may not be 
aware of the implications sometimes of programs or policies uh, on the on the ground that you're dealing with? Yeah, I, it's hard to know where to start. So <laughs> sorry. Uh, let me start by just saying my town is essentially the northernmost municipality in the GTA. And in the time between when I started undergrad and graduated law school, we almost quadrupled from about 12,000 to just under 50,000 today. We're one of the, if not the fastest growing municipalities in the province, if not the country. And the years we're second, it's our neighbor in East Guillenberry who beats us. So that massive growth is its own set of challenges. We're uh, traditionally the, uh, the Holland Marsh, the soup and salad bowl of Canada is the economic driver still to this day through agriculture. My ward is a portion of the Holland Marsh and what I call the older end of town, the, the historic downtown in the suburbs from the early 80s. My ward was the town when I was growing up. And so when the report talks about growing past being rural to being essentially a suburb, we're living that. The, the rural portions of town still exist, but the town itself is pretty packed uh, urban center within, within the north end of the GTA. And placemaking is what that is all becoming about and collaboration. And we need to be able to work well with the province and the federal government on these pieces because the sustainability is going to be driven by our GO train station and densifying near there. The placemaking is going to be driven, um, no pun intended, uh, mm -hmm. by redoing a complete streets transformation of our downtown, which for 40 years has been a de facto regional highway rather than a, a place for, for commerce and people. So placemaking and we're building a new downtown or a new town hall in our downtown to help anchor that. Uh, our library during uh, the pandemic became that center for digital service and entrepreneurship. We're uh, trying to build a, a small business incubator by renovating an old public school into a community center. One end will be the food bank and some other social services. The other will be a small business incubator because entrepreneurship and dare I even say a bit of a creative classroom I work at home rather than having to commute into Toronto is a huge part of our reality. So to your question about the federal and provincial governments, I, I think we, we work quite well um, together, but I'll, I'll say, uh, paraphrasing a, uh, a person who's well known in this town, better is always possible. And to paraphrase another uh, uh, eminent progressive politician, Stacey Abrams, rural Canada is a cheap date. <laughs> Five and a half million dollars announced by MP Tony Van Bynen for that school retrofitting and renovation project was front page news and both our local papers, CBC Radio, the local radio station and the CTV news affiliate. And for us, it's nearly 10% of our annual capital budget and it essentially doubles our ability to make development charges and property taxes stretch further to deliver more. So every ounce of federal support, I mentioned to the minister, we are just finishing rehabilitating and improving a park in my ward. The quarter of a million dollar grant from the federal government made that possible quite literally. That might be nothing to Ottawa or Toronto, but to us, that, that stops us from essentially a tax increase. So it really matters. So uh, let me uh, pick up on that and others can join in here, um, but I'll, I'm going back to you first, Jonathan, if you want to engage with this, which is the question of uh, local collaboration, planning, uh, planning around infrastructure, uh, so you talked a lot about uh, uh, community infrastructure for the delivery of social services, economic infrastructure, libraries, a lot of uh, somewhat anchor institutions, but uh, hubs for innovation. Um, uh, I think uh, many smaller communities feel that these are needed um, and want more investments. Would you say that uh, you have like wide consensus on how to prioritize these and how to plan and how to invest. Uh, or I know Mike, and you can pick up, there have certainly been communities that have not managed growth well, that uh, all of a sudden there's a subdivision and there are no services. Um, so how do you manage that planning for growth, investing in the kind of social, economic, digital infrastructure that makes the community livable and a place that businesses want to be? Um, and, and yeah, people need to places to live. So to build houses, but you don't want to just create um, uh, subdivisions with no sustainability or services. Yeah, that's an important question, and we've tried to get. We've tried to say we want a 
intensify, particularly downtown and near a GO train station. But we have, I think it's fair to say, seen suburban sprawl as well. And recognizing that in Ontario, the Planning Act has sort of changed under our feet in the past few weeks. Uh, we're still trying to sort all of that out because, uh, Mike, you and I have talked about this before, housing, even in a town growing as quickly as ours, I think my parents' down pay or my parents' house price wouldn't be a down payment today, and so that that's a huge challenge. But uh, the industrial land trying to create uh, an economic base in town, in addition to our agricultural base along the 400, are huge. But they have a massive labor problem, and I have a lot of people who still commute into the city rather than working from home or or working in town. So trying to piece all of these uh, together is a challenge. But we're trying do it in such a way uh, where we're prioritizing job creation, I think we have to recognize that a lot of our economic vitality is going to come from entrepreneurship, uh, particularly, I think they call themselves mumpreneurs, the, the mums who start a baking store out of their house and eventually buy a beautiful storefront in our downtown or pillars of the community. And how do you follow more of that? Uh, the, the school retrofit project I mentioned will have a commercial kitchen and a bunch of my council colleagues were talking about it the other night about how that commercial kitchen is actually going to be an economic driver because you can have cooking classes. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I think we've gone through a, a transformation in our mentality over the last decade. I think some people on this panel were probably ahead of, ahead of the curve, but childcare, community services, uh, uh, infrastructure, these are not just cost centers. These are investments that pay dividends. They may not pay dividends in year one or year two, um, but uh, obviously they pay returns uh, over time. Um, uh, I'll ask Mike and the chief and, and Mary, this, uh, uh, sorry, Zita, this question, um, which is about uh, building on Jonathan's point about uh, planning and collaboration. Uh, what are some of the best and worst models you have seen that um, uh, you think uh, strengthen community or threaten community in the agendas you're talking about? Mike? Well, I, I think the, uh, you know, where we see this go go wrong in, in rural southwestern Ontario is just the, the sort of immediate need to, to create more sprawl. They, they see sort of an opportunity here where, uh, you know, you might you might have some budget pressures and you might have a community say, oh, we've got a bunch of land over there. Let's just build 2,000 single detached homes uh, and get a bunch of DCs, uh, development charges, and then, uh, you know, hopefully we, we can use that to... Uh, pay for some, you know, is basically existing services. I think that's where you got a problem. And I, I can, you know, I, I sympathize with these smaller communities um, in, in the sense that they, they feel like they're damned if they do, damned if they don't, right? If they don't, uh, if they don't build, they're going to have a massive affordability crisis. But if they do build, they just basically get more families moving in from the GTA. And I've had so many councillors and, and mayors and, and Reeves say that to me. It was just like, we're trying to create the conditions for affordability here, and we just we just can't, right? Because again, people people are mo mobile, and you have this drive till you qualify. But despite all of that going on, you know, despite these pressures, I think you do need to step back and go, okay, the decisions we make today uh, have you know fifty, seventy five hundred year consequences. So you know, let's slow down. Let's really try and plan this out, get some density, and make sure that. We're, we're actually creating communities that we're not just creating, uh, you know, suburbs of London or Kitchener or whatever. But, you know, people have the, the arenas, the community centers, the parks. So they're not just having to feel like they're, they're getting forced to drive back to those to those cities. So it is all about being able to to long term plan at the same time that you do recognize that, that you're you're in a crisis and you're having to deal with that. Uh, Chief. I, um, I, I didn't mention before, there are 104 First Nations across Canada that are part of First Nations lands management. And that means there are 104 communities that are really open to business and um, really quite interested in collaboration. I was thinking the other day about, um, you know, what makes Scugog Township, as an example, unique? Well, it's, it's, it's proximity proximity to a lake, but also to its First Nation community. And I remember just prior to the pandemic uh, starting, Toronto Life named Port Perry as one of the most, you know, top 10 
uh, great places to to live and and settle down. And and we had this influx of people coming in, of course, throughout the pandemic. So it's put a lot of pressure on Port Perry. And I've had our local council coming to me saying, "What are we going to do? Like, we need your help because because um, our families are having to leave our long-standing families, and it it creates this kind of um, pressure point between uh, the old guard and and the new the newcomers. How how interesting, how ironic. But uh, but I I do uh, I do I do uh, feel those pressures for our community. And what has been I think a real highlight of the relationship that Scugog First Nation has with our municipal partners. I mean, it took us a while to get there, but we. Uh, we ended up collaborating uh, quite a bit on on local projects that we found of, of of value together and agreed on. And I think if if we could promote um, promote that type of collaboration between First Nations and their local surrounding communities, that would uh, that would do a lot for better relations, but also you know obviously um, stretch a dollar farther. <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll leave it at I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Chief. Um, Zita, did, uh, and I, I'd be very interested, and I think people would, your thoughts and uh, experiences over the last uh, number of years as you have, uh, have rolled out uh, your projects, what some of those uh, challenges are or really exceptional practices uh, on the collaboration side for community economic development? Yes, yeah, so the, the we're not going to go back to 1958. Now we're just going to go back to 2006. <laughs> uh, in 2006, I was I'd left my career and I went home with the intention to put another leg on the economy, uh, to do it in a way that supported the things we love, like culture, for example. And you know, I think I know a thing or two about business. And I I have to say, the community economic development is the hardest possible work anybody could ever, if you're thinking about getting into it as a career, do it, but like, it's the hardest possible thing and you'll be underpaid and people will say bad things about you. Um, but I that, know another career like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, so, you know, I had this kind of arrogance that business people often have when we come to challenges and I started to realize, wow, nothing connects around the place. Plane schedules don't line up with ferry schedules at all. Everything is optimized for some system, whether it's the health system or the transportation system or the school system. Oh, no, we can't put daycare in the school because it's a different system. And now I've got to go talk. Well, who, who controls that? Oh, that's somebody in Gander. That's a provincial thing. Uh, so anyway, it's all disconnected loose ends. Uh, so I feel like I've spent whatever, how long ago that has been 15 years trying to make something work when nothing actually connects. So all these gaps are what we're talking about. Uh, the pilot project that we have been doing for the past year, which is wrapped and the, the report is on our website, uh, impossible to find, but good luck. If you, I think if you click on something about what we do, you'll eventually find it. Anyway, we partnered with these five communities that I mentioned. And uh, one of the things that uh, happened to me in 2019 is I read a book, one particular book, I read a lot of books, called The Third Pillar by an economist named Rajan. And he said, and he was like, he described all of my 15 years of pain. Uh, he's an economist. He used to be head of the Federal Reserve Bank of India. He's at the University of Chicago now. I really like economists, Mike. We need more economists, the right kind of economists. Anyway, he said human societies rest on three pillars, governments, markets, and communities. And in the last 50 bad years, we have forgotten about the community pillar. We already talked about that. And he said, so the path forward how do these three pillars actually come together and collaborate? Because what we've seen is kind of too much of, maybe less in Canada than other places, too much of government going, well, we're going to leave all that to the market. I mean, Canada as a country is like an impossible idea, right? Like, it makes no sense. Unless we make it make sense. So are we going to entirely leave to the market what, what transportation systems hold our country together? Are we going to just, you know, chase low-cost low carriers to fly to Esteban? This is not going to go well. They so, even fly to well, there you go. We, I know you don't want them. You don't want them. They're just yeah. that's not the right way. Uh, but anyway, these architectures will collaborate. How do governments and businesses and communities come together? So I think we need. We don't have a lot of them. We need to grow more of them. Now let's talk about on the ground. Most communities that are small, I would say, struggle with just being self-canceling. 
you think this, I think that, I never liked your mother, so I'm not going along with what you want to do anyway. And so, and I think when you say community, too often people think it means municipality. And so the municipality, and in, so in Rajan's language, really the third pillar, um, he says local governments, municipal governments, are not part of the government pillar. Even though in our country they are handmaidens of provinces, they actually belong to the, the community pillar. And so the best example, because I think this was your first question, it, we saw in our pilot project was Victoria, B.C., and there's probably someone in Victoria watching this now thinking, she's going to say this again. I know she's going to say it. And what I'm going to say is it's one of the best examples I've ever seen of a, a, an architecture for collaboration in a local place. It's called the South Island Prosperity Partnership. It brings together the city of Victoria and all of the municipalities around, the indigenous communities around, and businesses. And it's a complicated tangle, but it is a complicated tangle. And you know, the minute we think it's not a complicated tangle, we oversimplify, well, nothing's going to happen. So the best example I've seen is, is the SIP. Um, I, and, I, and I think this kind of understanding that we are going to do this together, and we need to be formal about that. It can't just be you're going to have a, an ad hoc meeting. Uh, on Fogel Island, we have something called an economic development partnership, which we're trying to bring to life, which has a fishing industry represented. Us, Shorefast, which has you know the, a big part of the tourism industry, and the municipality that hasn't. And this has been a rough go because we're not used to working together. We're not used to sharing power. We're not used to planning together. I mean, economic community economic development takes all of us. And then you know, there's a and the last thing I'll say is there's a, an American organization called the Center for Community Investing, and they talk about communities readiness. So even if we could get money to flow from big pockets to small pockets, even if we could, communities aren't ready to manage money coming or not coherence. And, and they have a great tagline, which is um, resources follow coherence. And too often in local places, we're not coherent to an outside investor, big or small. And when it, and when it comes our way, how do, we, how do we manage it? How do we work together, even if I don't like your mother? And I think that that's the, that's the big opportunity. No one likes my mother. Okay. <laughs> um, if you've met her. The, um, so uh, we're going to have time for maybe one or two questions. But I am, uh, if you think about whether you have a question, uh, I'm going to ask the minister. Uh, thinking about these architectures of collaboration, the, the South Island Prosperity Partnership, um, a variety of these kinds of uh, planning processes, building coherence, building investable opportunities. Uh, do you see a role for the federal government in, in engaging with this? Or what is the role for the federal government in, in supporting these local communities as they plan and engage and um, try and attract tourism or investment? Most, most definitely, Matthew. And I thought Zita was going to tell her Lane story because she's she tells another another example, and I've taken it from, we, we talked about it in the tourism industry, but I put it in everything. So in lane one, you have those that are chugging along, always going to do it the same way because we don't want any surprises. Then you have the lane two, which is more, I hate your mother, everything is wrong, not doing any of it. And then in lane three, you have the movers and the shakers and the doers. And you can put that into community. You can put that into business. You can put that into tourism. You can put it into anything. So how do we get people from lane one into lane three and therefore like make lane two smaller? <laughs> and there are some shining examples, but I watch every day and I'm very cognizant of how do we do that because we can't leave people behind. There are a couple of groups. There's another one that, that I reference a lot in, in Western Newfoundland and Labrador, and it's a Grossmore Cooperative Institute. So that's the footprint of Grossmore National Park, where there are seven major communities and this is a not-for-profit that works with the communities, works with business, works with, um, there's an indigenous community there. So she's the glue that makes them all come together. Um, Zita knows this woman. She's a tour de force as well. But she basically makes everybody come together to talk about the opportunities and the growth potential that is there. Now, it's not easy. She will tell you because there's an awful lot of, I don't like your mothers there. But she's like, well, how do we move beyond that? And in the, this is the 50th year anniversary of the park this year. And this group has been around for 25, 28 years. They have invested $40 million themselves into the park with partnerships and collaboration and bringing people together and 
everybody's holding hands and we're going to do this together, whether you, you know, it's not whether you like it or not, but they're seeing over the years that this is working. So to Zita's point, like you're not going to change it overnight, but we all, and we as the federal government have to be cognizant of how do you get people from lane one into lane three? We need the help because if not, we're not going to see these really small, remote, and indigenous communities. There's some incredible indigenous communities, Chief. You know that. And there are others that rip my heart out. But we it's not just throwing money at it. It's not throwing money at it. It's how do we hold hands, be it with a pathfinder service, with is it helping other groups, like I just said, this not-for-profit get on their feet to help communities hold hands to go together to get us all in a better place. Because, look, the world has what Canada wants. The world has what rural Canada wants. And we're only going to get there if we all work together. And your report's going to be a good anchor for that, too. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm curious. I know the chief wants to uh, wanted to engage. Yeah. <coughs> I did just want to add that um, in, in reading this report, I think one of the biggest points was obviously highlighting the need for collaboration. And that is really in our DNA as First Nations. That's uh, how we've survived all this time. We are fierce individuals. We are not a monolithic voice, but um, often defined by our disagreements more so. But uh, we we have to collaborate. That is that is who we are. And so I'm really interested in uh, language of consultation, uh, processes around consultation and commitments to consultation, because it doesn't... Um, it can buttress a, a process rather than stymie it. I made a, co a comment earlier that 104 First Nations are open for business. Really, I think it's 634 that are open for business, but 104 are part of lands management. And uh, each of our communities uh, across Canada, is, has, it, it, they are special places uh, built on rich cultures and, and very um, wonderful people. And so uh, I hope that... Uh, I hope we can bridge that divide and uh, move forward. So thank you for putting this paper out. Thank you, Chief. Um, and are collaboration means mucking along together. Mucking yeah. along together. Yes. Uh, are, are there any questions? We have time for one question. We've got one. First hand up gets first question. First and only. Hi. Hi, my name is Sebastian. I'm the Chief Economist at Strategy Corp. I'm from a small town, so this uh, conversation really strikes home. And for the record, everyone loves my mom. Uh, <laughs> the small town. <laughs> Um, one of the um, one of the issues when it comes to economic development is the role of demographics. Uh, we often think of you know aging population. You know it puts pressure on the healthcare system, but we don't necessarily think about the other impacts on economic development. And per perhaps one of the most telling is aging entrepreneurs in local communities. You often have those stores or you know those businesses that are really anchors. But then when it comes times to retire, then what? Right? You don't necessarily have people that want to take the business over and whatnot. So I would love to hear the panel discuss a little bit uh, the link between demographics and economic development. Um, if I'm, I'm, that's an excellent question and certainly succession planning and um, uh, creating relationships between uh, immigrants and smaller communities and programs to help. And sometimes that requires capital to do the succession um, are all really important. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use that question to go to Mike um, and then kind of come down the list, uh, come down the panel here, and I'd like everyone to just kind of offer one final thought on, um, you know, what people leaving this room today should take away in terms of, uh, you know, how to confront those challenges or other challenges, a key message. Yes, yeah. Mike. Yeah, so, so related to that question, I do, I do think the uh, housing challenge actually is an opportunity for a lot of small communities to um, get uh, more population and grow, uh, growth and get young families moving in. And again, we've seen that uh, across southwestern Ontario that there's a lot of challenges here, but it's been great to see so many main streets across rural southwestern Ontario revitalize those storefronts open again. Now, oftentimes they're, they're reopening. Uh, it's a completely different thing. It would be nice to see that secession. But overall, yeah, we are seeing this demographic uh, shift because of the housing crisis, and it is having a lot of benefits. Thank you. Jonathan. There's so many more things I would love yeah. to say, but yeah, 30 seconds. I, there we go. I, I, I think I mentioned infrastructure and the role the federal and provincial governments can play in supporting us. And that is roads and it is transit, but I also think it has to be what I've taken to calling environmental mitigation infrastructure. We have, the minister mentioned the Disaster Mitigation and Adaptation Fund. 
uh, and along with the provincial government, our municipalities locally are going to be able to build a phosphorus remediation recycling facility to protect Lake Simcoe. We're one big lake over from the Chief's uh, First Nation, and the First Nation in Lake Simcoe know that the water quality is integral to our entire economic and cultural reality. So I think when we talk about infrastructure, I would just inject the environmental infrastructure we need because we're growing rapidly. Yeah, and the, the demographic pressure and environmental uh, uh, infrastructure is huge. Chief LaRocca. I think I'd be remiss if I um, didn't say that um, we need to re-examine the, the current provincial use of MZOs to uh, to uh, promote its housing agenda. I, um, I think that uh, further to the point in the paper, if we have architecture for uh, collaboration, it'll allow, us to, it'll allow us to sit in the mire and, and really bridge that gap between the new guard and the old guard, and, and particularly in small town Ontario that I feel and uh, live within in Port Perry. And I, I think uh, it'll kind of ignite that conversation and force people back together in a, after what's been a very divisive experience with the pandemic. So look forward to some change. Thank you, Chief. Speaking of the Meyer, uh, Zita. How we muck along together. I want to come back to scale. And then after that, let's talk about scale and scale. And uh, to your question, which is such an important question in every place that I'm aware of in the country, including Fogo Island, we have, I don't know, 60 or 70 businesses on the island, probably half a dozen to a dozen are about to change hands and may close. In our case, it, it isn't so much that we don't have people who want to buy the businesses, but they can't get access to capital because the one bank we did have up and left. And so I, I think the access to financial capital is really pressing. And back to the scale problem, Mike, you may know these statistics, but the investment economy is a very different place than the real economy. We live, most of us live in places of the real economy, and the investment economy is probably 80% of our GDP or something. And it's all very focused around big scale things. Like we have some of the biggest banks in the world, some of, some of the biggest pension funds in the world, and they're looking for those kinds of scales. So what we've ended up with is small communities like, like your hometown and my hometown that uh, are unbanked and underfinanced. So what is Canada in that case? It's a bunch of stranded assets to use business language. So I think we've got a, which is with technology in particular, I'm not expecting banks to come and we lost our bank this summer on Fogo Island. I'm not expecting someone to come and, you know, build a great big old new bank and have 20 people waiting for you to walk in the door. But we have the technology to do it. We just need now to come up with really smart business models that allow money to flow at different scales, build that financial, the plumbing for, for it to flow. So scale. What would you like us to take away from this and how we can help you? Oh, how you can help me. Keep doing what you're doing because it's this isn't a one-person job. This is everybody working together to break that glass ceiling. I think for me, the the thing, the, the number one thing that, that I need your help with is understanding that one size does not fit all. Be it in a bank, be it in infrastructure, be it in indigenous programming, be it in anything. And we've got to make sure that when you talk to my colleagues and people developing policy and programs that it is different in rural Canada. And it has to be different in rural Canada. And if we do that, rural Canada will succeed. Thank you very much. Uh, my one message is collectively we all need to work together to invest and plan to grow sustainably because we are going to be growing and we need to collaborate to help manage that planning. Um, otherwise, we are not going to manage that growth well. So uh, thank you to all of the panelists, to Canada 2020, to TELUS, uh, to Shorefast, uh, to all of you who participated in this project. And uh, thanks for coming. Bye. Thank you. Thank you very, very much to Chief Laraka, Minister Hutchings, and frankly, the minister's team for their deep level of engagement on the way into this, which was really helpful. Zita, Jonathan, Mike, and especially to Matthew for your leading not just conversation, but this whole project uh, in the way into it. Uh, it's really been a, a lot of ground covered, and we'll muck around together for a long time, I think, because as some of us have talked about, Jacob included, this is not uh, the end of a conversation today. It's really the, the beginning of it, and we really look forward to that. So once again, a big thank you to our special guests and to you, as well as to TELUS for their support 
of this project and support and Shorefest, as was mentioned, for their support with today's discussion in particular. And thank you for being here to help shape this beautiful, uh, this beautiful, better future for such important parts of our country. Um, as Matthew said, uh, and as Zita really leaned into a lot, um, there is not uh, needing to be any divide between urban and rural Canada and how we see the economic future of our country. And they've really laid out today why uh, that will matter so much to that economic success. So thanks again and see you very soon. Take care. Thank you.